coming up on the world today. Western powers, Germany and the United States threaten to the, the future of the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline if Russia invades Ukraine. 77 years on, countries remember the Holocaust. Plus, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson promises the official report into parties held in Downing Street during the lockdown will be published in full. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani here in Lagos. So begin here in Africa as a day Zata, a military takeover in the country. A senior party member of ousted President Rock Kabore says he is doing well. According to him, Mr. Kabore is detained in a presidential villa under house arrest. He is physically well and has a doctor at his disposal. For several hours on Monday, the fate of the ousted president remained unclear, with conflicting information circulating about an arrest and an assassination attempt. An extraordinary virtual summit of the West African Regional Bloc ECOWAS will be held on Friday to discuss the situation in Burkina Faso after Mr. Gabori was overthrown with possible sanctions against the military. In the meantime, Israel has a new ambassador to South Africa, but not everyone is happy about this. Ambassador Ilyev Belotsekovsky was among a batch of diplomats who presented their letters of credence to President Cyril Ramaphosa, who they told that Israel believes that there are many things both countries can do together in the fields of education, science and technology, food security and climate change. South Africa, which has no substantive ambassador in Israel, has post-apartheid been very vocal on the plight of Palestinians in the occupied territories in the Middle East. Our South Africa Bureau correspondent, Betty Dibia, reports. Israel's new ambassador to South Africa, Eliev Belutsakovsky, was among the latest batch of high commissioners received on Wednesday by President Sir Ram Posa. We believe that there is a tremendous potential in us working together. Together we can share dreams and together we can fulfill them. Your Excellency, I am honored to present you with a letter of recall of my predecessor and the letter of my credentials. While his speech seemed well received by the President and some other parties, other groups like the African National Congress's alliance partners are not happy. This is because the ruling party had resolved on several platforms about their stance against what they describe as Israel's apartheid policies against Palestinians. Even President Zir Ramaphosa himself spoke up against the decision to grant Israel an official observer status at the African Union in July last year, a position he reiterated at a party meeting last week. We are opposed to their admission. We are concerned about the decision that has been made. And as it is now, a number of countries on the continent are expressing their unhappiness and dissatisfaction. Several pro-Palestinian groups in South Africa have staged protests on several locations over several Israel-related issues, including the participation of Mid-South Africa in the last Miss Universe pageant hosted by Israel. We asked Professor Stephen Friedman of the Center for the Study of Democracy, University of Johannesburg, what he makes of what looks like mixed messaging from the president. I can see that people might feel, well, this is, uh, this, this is a mixed message. Um, but uh, I would see it somewhat differently. I, I, I think realistically it, it indicates uh, the, the, the limits to uh, campaigns to, to end diplomatic relations. Um, uh, I mean, morally, you can obviously make a very good case for doing it. Um, but I mean, for example, just, just as one indication, uh, I mean, during uh, apartheid in South Africa, uh, the Scandinavian country, Sweden in particular, was, was very helpful to the anti-apartheid movement. But they never, ever broke off diplomatic relations with apartheid South Africa. You know, I think it's always useful if you, if you, you know, if you, pressing for a moral campaign or for change to 
you know, to, to have a realistic assessment of what is possible and what's not. South Africa recalled her ambassador to Israel, Sisang Gombane, in May 2018, following the death of protesting Palestinians in Gaza, and no replacement has been sent since then. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. Our South Africa Bureau Chief there. Now to other stories out of the continent. NATO countries, Germany and the United States are warning Russia of the possibility of its gas pipeline being cut off if it does invade Ukraine. A U.S. State Department spokesperson said the Nord Stream 2 pipeline will not move forward if Russia were to attack. The controversial energy project is designed to double gas flow and runs from Russia directly to Germany under the Baltic Sea. The White House on Wednesday said it faced challenges in finding alternative sources of energy supplies to Europe if Russia invades Ukraine and energy flows from Russia are interrupted, but pledged to continue talks with companies and countries. The European Union depends on Russia for around a third of its gas supplies. Any interruption to its Russian imports will exacerbate an existing energy crisis caused by shortages and low reserves. That's been our objective, um, is to ensure that we are prepared uh, for the possibility of the supply, uh, the natural gas supply, which as you know is very much a regional issue and there would be a big regional impact, less so here in the United States, as well as the global oil supply and ensuring there is enough supply in the market. People on the streets of Moscow were skeptical about the chances of success for diplomatic solution to the growing crisis with Ukraine, following talks between Russia, Ukraine, France and Germany on Wednesday, saying people don't want war. They want peace and tranquility, as everyone is tired of war and disasters. Russia has demanded NATO pull troops and weapons from Eastern Europe and by its neighbor Ukraine, a former Soviet state, from ever joining Washington. And its NATO allies reject that position, but say they are ready to discuss other topics, such as arms control and confidence-building measures. The Kremlin says there's room to continue dialogue with the United States, but that it looks clear Russia's main security demands have not been taken into account by Washington. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov says Moscow will not rush to draw conclusions following the U.S. response to its proposals for a redrawing of post-Cold War security arrangements in Europe. Describing tensions on the continent as reminiscent of the Cold War, Peskov says it will take time for Moscow to review the U.S. response. Meanwhile, Ukraine's ambassador to Berlin says Germany's offer of 5,000 military helmets to Ukraine is useful, but that what Kiev really needs are defensive weapons. German Defense Minister Christine Lambrecht earlier told reporters that Berlin was supplying a field hospital to Ukraine and was still aiming for a peaceful solution. Berlin has faced growing criticism for its refusal to supply arms to Ukraine, as other Western countries have done. Ukraine's army remains on alert for the outcome of talks today between the U.S. and Russia, saying there was much worry about the situation, but are certain matters will not escalate too dramatically. British Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says the U.K. is not going to judge countries who have chosen not to supply Ukraine with lethal weapons. He said this at a news conference alongside his German counterpart, Christine Lambrecht. Germany will supply 5,000 helmets to Ukraine to help defend against a possible Russian invasion. The German Defense Minister has said Germany's actions are in response to the request for military equipment, specifically for helmets. The advantage of being in NATO is there are 30 allies, so we can all assist Ukraine in our own way. Obviously the United Kingdom has taken a view that lethal aid uh, of a tactical defensive nature is something that the Ukrainians need, but we're not sitting in judgment over other countries. I think with 30 allies there are plenty of assistances to go around. Um, I'm you know, delighted Germany is supplying helmets and field hospital, hospital support. Uh, I think Nord Stream 2 is important. Uh, and uh, I know the uh, German Chancellor has talked about it being uh, one of the areas that would be under consideration. 
Uh, and I think that if uh, President Putin chose to invade Ukraine and all the consequences, then he should not be rewarded uh, by Europe funding him any further. Because, of course, what he does with the revenues from gas is he funds his military, which is why one of the reasons he can amass over 100,000 people on the border of another country. For the the Deutsche Welle's Thomas Sparrow joins us now here in Berlin. Thomas, great to see you. Uh, what is Germany's position then on the Ukraine-Russia crisis? Province connecting with uh, Thomas. We'll try to reconnect with him later. In the meantime, it's another Holocaust memorial today in Germany. Holocaust survivor Inge Aubacher commemorated the victims. The 87-year-old who is now a U.S. citizen at an unusual memorial ceremony in Bundestag today, a day German concentration and extermination camp, Auschwitz, was liberated by Soviet troops in 1945. Our backer was deported from Stuttgart to the concentration camp when she was seven years old. There she met Ruth, who's the same age, whose family shared a room with hers. The two girls became friends. Bundestag President Babel Bass, who also welcomed uh, Mickey, Mickey Levy, president of the Israeli parliament, to the Bundestag, warned about the dangers of anti-Semitism. He said anti-Semitism is there. It's not only found on the far fringes, not only among the eternally unteachable and a few anti-Semitic trolls on the net. It's a problem of our society, of society as a whole. Anti-Semitism is in our midst. Well, there are also commemorations in Israel, but they were marred by protests against COVID-19 measures uh, for those protesters who like themselves, uh, liken themselves to Jews under Nazi persecution and become a new contributor, contributor to global anti-Semitism, according to the Israeli government. Such Holocaust tropes have become widespread and along with Israel's May war in Gaza, uh, where main factors behind physical and online attacks on Jews in Europe and in North America last year. Several U.S. and British politicians have in recent months apologized after suggesting vaccine or closure policies recalled Hitler's regime. Some demonstrators against pandemic curbs have worn yellow stars like those the Nazis forced on European Jews. We have more stories coming up on The World Today. Plus. Against all odds, the story of one woman who gave birth after walking three days to escape violence in Northern Canada. Welcome back to the world today. Still waiting on that conversation between the U.S. and Russian leaders are seeking a diplomatic solution to the Ukrainian crisis. In the meantime, Germany says it will supply 5,000 military helmets to Ukraine to help defend against a possible Russian invasion. And that action has been criticized by many, even in Ukraine. But the German government has defended its uh, move, saying that the action was in response to a request for military equipment, specifically helmets, by the Ukrainian army. The DW is uh, Thomas Sparrow is in Berlin. We tried to reach him earlier on. We have him now. Thomas, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. What is Germany's position on the Ukraine-Russia crisis? Germany is really hoping on dialogue on the so-called Normandy format, which in previous years brought together Russia, Ukraine, France and Germany. In fact, already the first meetings of this new Normandy format are due to take place. And Germany is really hoping that that can prove helpful when it comes to solving this standoff between Russia and Ukraine. Germany, however, faces a very big dilemma. On the one hand, it has very deep economic relations with Russia, in particular a pipeline called Nord Stream 2, which links 
Russia to Germany, which is finished and now only waiting for regulatory approval. But Germany's allies fear that that could put Europe at risk and that that is giving too much power to Russia. On the other hand, Germany is very close with its political allies in the European Union, in the US, that any Russian aggression has to be res responded to in a very concrete way. So you have two German positions and a very strong criticism towards Germany's stance because there are countries and there are analysts within the European Union and the United States that are saying that Germany is threatening European Union unity by being so economically close to Russia. Well, we understand that uh, Germany is uh, having this fine dance with uh, Russia. But in the meantime, the uh, German uh, Defense Secretary has explained, you know, why just uh, a few helmets are being sent to Ukraine. But really, what is the reason? Why does Germany refuse to send defensive weapons instead? And this is the second very important difference between Germany and some of its allies. The United States, for instance, the United Kingdom, have all sent now weapons to Ukraine, defensive weapons to Ukraine. Germany's position here is different. Germany does not want to send defensive weapons to Ukraine, essentially because it believes that that could make matters worse, that that could actually threaten that focus on talks, that focus on diplomacy that we have mentioned. Again, there's criticism from people who believe that Germany should actually be following suit, should be following some of its closest allies in sending defensive weapons to Ukraine. In fact, something that Ukrainian leaders have also been repeatedly asking Germany to do. Again, this is a stance in which Germany differs from some of its closest political allies. Uh, Thomas, you had mentioned uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline earlier uh, with my first question. How big is the problem which, uh, how big is the problem, you know, with this particular project uh, between Russia and the rest of Europe because it supplies gas uh, to the rest of Europe and anything uh, could jeopardize the supply as we speak? It is a very big problem. It's been a problem for many years when it was actually being built. Angela Merkel's government always thought of the Nord Stream 2 as a commercial pipeline, as one that was not as political as probably uh, the United States or other European countries thought. It has for a long time put Germany at odds with its closest political allies because it essentially links Russia to Germany. The idea from an economic perspective is to transport Russian gas to Germany and then to other European countries. But countries like the United States or European countries like Poland have for a very long time thought that that could actually be a liability, that that could actually be a problem when it comes to dealing with Russia. For example, when there is a big international crisis like the one that we're seeing now with Ukraine. Thomas, thanks again for bringing us up to speed on this. Uh, we'll be looking out you know, for more German response to this. And of course, that conversation between uh, the U.S. Uh, president and uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, later today and the others that are holding tomorrow. Staying in Europe, though, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson today again committed to publishing a full and internal report into parties and social gatherings held at his Downing Street residence during coronavirus lockdowns. Asked to confirm the report to be published in full, he said, of course. He told reporters he could not say anything new on when the report will be made public. Johnson, the one two in 2019, won the biggest conservative majority in more than 30 years, is braced for the publication of the official investigation into claims that there were multiple boozy Downing Street parties. During lockdowns, he told Parliament no rules were broken. Two other matters. Uh, are you delaying the Sue Gray report? Absolutely not, but uh, you'll just have to, I'm afraid, you've got to let the, the independent uh, inquiries go on. When, and, and when do you think it'll be published? You, I, I, I wish I, I can't really say any more uh, than what I said yesterday about that. I'm, I'm Will really you publish sorry. it in full? Of course. So exactly as Sue Gray, the report as Sue Gray hands to you, that will be made public without any redactions? I, I can't go beyond what I said yesterday, but that, I, I, I stick completely by what I've, uh, what I've said to the, to the House of Commons. But what, I, what I, I hope people understand is that while we wait for 
uh, all that to go on. We've got to get on, and the government is getting on uh, with our work. So it's, it's, it's clearing the COVID backlogs, but also making sure that we help to fix the, the, the cost of living crisis, help to, uh, help to address the issues with inflation by helping to move people off welfare into work with way to work. Uh, and did you on well, now to a story of uh, victory, you could say that, and then of tragedy. Well, as we know, it's after the narrow escape from violence, a refugee now in Chad gave birth to triplets, which was a good part. But the other part is that with just limited resources provided to the refugees, the mother of seven is struggling to feed her family. Heavily pregnant for T. Millian journeyed for three days by foot and dug out canoe last month to flee violence in northern Cameroon between herders, farmers and fishermen. Upon arriving in neighboring Chad, an equally daunting test awaited her. Three weeks later, the 32-year-old mother of seven gave birth to triplets in a hospital in the capital, in Damina. Even when I was pregnant in Cameroon, I didn't know I was carrying triplets, but physically I was in pain. I couldn't walk a few meters without sitting down. And when conflict broke out, I said to myself that given my condition, it was urgent that I take shelter with my seven other children. Eliane fled her ethnic Musgum fishing and farming village last month when it was attacked by Arab Choa herders who burned down her neighbor's house. According to the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, more than 100,000 Cameroonians fled the violence and dozens were killed in the tit-for-tat reprisal attacks, which broke out following dispute over dwindling water resources. Elian's husband and three eldest children stayed in Cameroon, where they sought refuge at a site for internally displaced persons. In Chad, she now has seven young mouths to feed from the limited rations provided to the refugees. The bed of the triplets is a blessing. But I am very worried because we have no food or money. Without assistance from the authorities, we will not be able to find food for the mother and her newborns. Eliane now lives in a refugee camp in Kalambari. She has started selling donuts at the local market not far from the refugee camp to help provide for her family. Chad is home to close to one million refugees. And the United Nations Refugee Agency says internally displaced people and its resources to respond to their needs are critically low. Well, here's hoping that she gets all the help that she needs. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Kubani.